lot of you have met me and known me over the years as the wife of John Oro. However, I also have my own little career. I've been a nurse since 1981. And uh, I'm currently uh, the director of health services for one of the largest school districts in Denver, Colorado. Um, I believe very strongly that a child's health is associated with their academic success. If you're not familiar with school nursing, what we do is we keep students healthy in school and ready to learn. If we're sitting in our clinics waiting for problems to roll in, we are not doing our jobs. Our jobs are to anticipate what our children's health needs might be and how we can promote their academic success through health. I'm going to give you just a little historical perspective on school nursing because everybody has these uh, preconceived notions of school nurses. We actually date back to 1902. A philanthropist in New York City uh, saw the dire needs of children living in tenements and he wondered why they weren't in school. They had too many excludable conditions and could not attend. So this philanthropist decided to go to the New York City School Board and ask to fund one school nurse. This one school nurse was so successful that within a month they hired 14 other school nurses. So that is the impact. Our job is to keep kids healthy and ready to learn. In 1968, the Department of Education added the nursing division. That would eventually evolve into the National Association of School Nurses. In 1973, legislation passed. It's the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. And you may have heard of 504 plans. These are accommodation plans. That's where that started. Uh, the ADA, uh, 2009, ADA is the Americans with Disabilities Act amended. And that broadly expanded the uh, definition of a disability in the school setting. Um, IDEA, individuals with ed Individuals with Disability and Education Act. That's another one of the major legislations that impacts school nursing. How do we function in a school setting? We're healthcare professionals in an educational setting. We work as members of a collaborative team. We kind of step over into all of these eight components, which include education, uh, PE, health services, of course, is kind of where we land, nutrition services, mental health, health and safety, healthy staffs, and family and communities. So we're kind of busy people. Now, why is awareness of Chiari at school important? Students spend more than half of their waking hours in the school setting. If you have a child with the Chiari malformation, they need some support. They need some protection and they need some services. School nurses provide that continuity of care between home and school we're able to communicate not only with the parents about what's happening with their child in the school day, but we also call you all as the healthcare provider to update you to the things that we're picking up on. And as I said before, health and academic success will always walk hand in hand. You guys work really hard with your pediatric populations, and we <coughs> want to make sure that the work that you do is not undone when these kids come to school. Uh, I just went over a few of the laws. Uh, you guys function under HIPAA. Have you ever heard of FERPA? That's what we function under. It's the Family Educational Rights to Privacy Act. In the school setting, health records are a part of the academic record. So we do not function at all under HIPAA, but we're happy to communicate with you and share information about the student in the school setting. Uh, IDEA, ADA, Section 504, and then we also have our practice dictated by the local board of nursing in our respective states. Um, how many of you here uh, prescribe medications for seizure disorders? Yes. Do you know what we're giving in the school setting now for seizures? I never imagined. For said. For said. And so we're facing a lot of challenges with that as well. Just a little antidote. Now, um, Section, or, or the uh, Americans with Disability Act was amended in 2009, and they vastly expanded the definition of a disability. A disability is a mental or physical impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. Children with Chiari may qualify as a student with a disability and receive uh, protection and services in the school setting. Now, have you guys heard of IEPs? IEPs are Individual Education Programs. <coughs> and let me just show you this way. This is general education, okay? That's a big circle. And then we have special education. That's a little tiny circle. Students who qualify for individual education programs fit inside this tiny little circle here. 
they're a student with a qualifying disability who require additional services or are not academically proficient and need targeted and intense interve interventions in the school setting to succeed. Uh, section 504, remember this big circle over here, general education? Kids who have disabilities yet are academically proficient don't need individual education programs or IEPs. They need a 504. And uh, to have a 504, you must have a qualifying disability. You must be academically proficient, but require those accommodations in the school setting. What we want for our kids is for them to access their free and appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment to the greatest extent possible with their non-disabled peers. All right, health needs acute and chronic. Now when a child or a student does not qualify for an IEP or a 504, where do we look to provide them that safety net? We look towards the development of something called an IHP, which is an individual health plan or a health care plan. We identify these kids, we notify their parents and their doctors because a lot of times our parents don't know what we can do for their children. Um, then we develop it, we continue to assess, and uh, we communicate with the health care providers uh, to receive authorization and then evaluate an outcome um, assessments are done. Now, we're going to discuss some of the current resources available because I've developed these resources for other organizations. I've done presentations for ASAP, and I've also developed tools for Conquer Chiari. Uh, what I did was I developed two specific tools. One is called Taking Chiari to School, a Guide for Parents, and this basically just kind of simply outlines what I just went over with you about IEPs, 504s, FERPA, HIPAA, all the different laws. <coughs> This is a very basic tool for parents. When they have been through the hospital experience dealing with a very ill child, they don't need a lot of complex jargon. They need simple information. I developed this a couple of years ago and it, it will probably be coming up uh, for review um, and it may actually go out of print because it, unless there are people there to update it and review it, it's not going to be current. Um, the next tool that I developed was uh, taking Chiari to school, a primer for school nurses. And I did a survey with the National Association of School Nurses just to kind of find out, you know, do school nurses even know how to pronounce Chiari? Do they know what it is? 50% had heard of it, but only 25% had ever developed a health care plan for students with Chiari. So the vast majority really had no experience. And then in doing a literature search for what's out there for school nurses, there's only one mention of Chiari in school nurse literature, and that was an editorial review of an article from another journal. So we have very limited information. So that leads you to wonder, what do school nurses need? What we need is a comprehensive, evidence-based, peer review article for the Journal of School Nursing. Uh, we need to have accommodation databases. In other words, what works for other kids? Why do we have to reinvent the wheel every time? Why can't we have an accessible database where we can go, this child has this specific problem related to Chiari. What are the accommodations that have worked in other settings? Uh, we also need a database of individual health care plans. Once again, we don't need to rewrite every single health care plan for a student. If there's a unique um, accommodation or health care plan that works for a student, let's borrow that from somebody else and see if it'll work for this other kiddo. We also need a parent advisory board. These are the things that we need to um, communicate with both parents, school nurses, education professionals, because we want to keep our kids at school safe, ready to learn, and kids with Chiari have the same needs that other kids with disabilities have. And finally, I'm going to close up uh, with saying that we know that our students need to be healthy to learn, and school nurses play a vital role in making sure children are healthy and ready to learn. And so I'm just putting it out there. I have started uh, a school nurse article on the Chiari malformation, um, but I would like for it to be a collaborative effort from experts in very specific fields. And uh, so far, the list of subtopics within the article that I have are a Chiari 1 malformation, the historical perspective, anatomy and physiology, the etiology, signs and symptoms, diagnosis and treatment, uh, comorbid conditions, and then this is very important, and there is a body of, of research out there, executive functioning. That's what we deal with in the school setting. 
um, implications for the school nurse, case studies, individual health plans, accommodations, and then other resources. So if you are interested in contributing to this effort and becoming a member of this collaborative team to develop this tool for school nurses, I welcome your participation and your feedback. Thank you very much.